That's good preaching. Amen. I'm here for the second sermon. Open your Bibles to the book of Hebrews, if you will, please. Chapter 2. I'm so honored to be part of this wonderful conference. I'm really excited that Pastor continued the meeting, and I'm glad you came. What a good crowd, good number of preachers. I was shocked. Brother Gibbs said if we had had half as many as we did, he would have been surprised. And thank you, preachers, for coming. Thank you, First Baptist Church, for hosting this meeting. And thank you for being such a wonderful church for my wife and I to be members of. And I am so glad that First Baptist Church of Bridgeport is still my church. People said, where do you live now? I said, I live in the same house. I'm a member of the same church, and I'm married to the same wife. And she is with me tonight. I'm introducing her, though she also needs no introduction. But if I got one, she should get one. She was with me last night, of course, as well. But I wasn't speaking then, so she didn't get any attention, and she was very disappointed. And... Uh, She's, everybody turn on and look at her. She loves when people look at her. She just really appreciates that. Thank you for being such a generous, loving, faithful church. So happy with my pastor. And uh, my goodness, he has added so many wonderful things, found so many new ways to get out the gospel, and has not changed any Bible truth. And I appreciate him very, very much. If you uh, look at chapter 2 and verse 1, the Bible says, therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. God also bearing them witness both with signs and wonders and with divers miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. Lord, would you help me as I preach to say the things that would please you, would draw us to yourself, would encourage us and correct us and challenge us and change us? Bind the devil, I pray. He always comes, you said, and tries to snatch the seed of your word away. And, and then, Lord, I pray that you'd open our hearts to your truth. Help us to decide in our own spirit that we'll be good ground. I'm glad to receive what you have for us. Bless the preaching. Bless the invitation. May we leave here loving you, knowing you, and willing to serve you better. In Jesus' name, amen. The Hebrew Christians were young in the faith. They had not been saved long. And they were second generation Christians. The Bible says the word was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. They didn't hear Jesus, but the ones who gave them the gospel had heard him. The ones who gave him the gospel had seen the signs and wonders. They had not seen them. And our passage gives us something wondrous and something of great warning. We see in our text a glorious Savior, a great salvation, and a grievous slipping. Our text begins with the word, therefore, which takes us back to the previous chapter. Therefore, because of what has just been said. What was just said? What was just said was all about the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, uh, he, the Bible says, I am the Lord God. That is my name and my glory will I not give to another. But Jesus prayed in John 17 and verse 5, O Father, gl glorify me with thine own self, with the glory which we had before the world was. Uh, uh, God said, I won't give my glory to anybody else. Jesus said, glorify me with the glory we had. You know why I said that? Because Jesus is God. And the Bible tells us in chapter 1 what a glorious Savior uh, we have. The Bible tells us He's glorious because He started everything. Uh, hath in these last days, verse 2 uh, of chapter 1, God with sundry times and divers men who spake in the past time by the fathers and by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by His Son, whom He hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also He made the worlds. Did you know our Savior made everything that is? Did you know the people who don't believe that don't believe it not because it's unscientific and not because it's unsupported by evidence? Oh no, the fossil record bears great testimony to every form of life coming into existence immediately. The idea of gradual evolution, the idea of a Big Bang is not supported scientifically even by science's own laws like the second law of thermodynamics. No, no, no. Uh, Francis Crick was the co-discoverer with Benjamin Watson of DNA, the building block 
of Life, won the Nobel Peace Prize for it. And Crick, when he saw how complex and amazing life was, said there's no way it came by evolution. So he began to believe that life on Earth was brought here from another planet. I never had the chance to speak to Dr. Crick, but if I had, I would have asked him, where did the life on that planet come from? No, people don't believe in creation because if you believe in creation, you have to follow the Creator. If He made us, He has the right to control us. Our Savior is glorious because He started everything. He's glorious, the Bible says, because He's the same as God in verse 3, who being the, ex the brightness of His glory and the express image of His person. Hey, don't let the Jehovah's Witnesses or the cultists confuse you. Jesus is God. He said, I and the Father are one. If you've seen me, you have seen the Father. Uh, I think the simplest, and the folks here will have heard me use this often, and the most helpful illustration of the Trinity is the illustration of space. For there to be space, there must be three dimensions, height and breadth and length. So which one of those is really space? Well, they're all really space. Take any one away, you have a flat surface. So they're, they're all the same then, not really. You put carpet on the floor, generally not on the walls. Generally don't uh, put windows in the walls and generally not on the floors. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, one God reveals Himself in three persons. God the Father is God and God the Son is God and God the Spirit is God. Our Savior is glorious because He started everything, because He's the same as God and because He is superior. The Bible says in verse 4, chapter 1, being made so much better than the angels as yet by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than their. In fact, the whole book of Hebrews tells us that Jesus is better. He's better than the angels. He's better than Moses. He's better than the priests. He's better than the sacrifices. He's better than the old covenant. He is superior and he's glorious because he sustains us. Verse 3, who being the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person, chapter 1, and upholding all things by the word of his power. Huh. Don't be too critical of science because every time, every once in a while, if you give them enough time, they catch up with the Bible. You know that people used to think that the earth was flat. But the Bible says it is he that sitteth on the circle of the earth. Long before man figured that out. Uh, they used to believe the earth had to rest on something. The idea of Charles Atlas holding up the world. Uh, uh, something had to underneath hold up the world. But the Bible says he hangeth the earth upon nothing. Scientists used to think they could count how many stars there were. And uh, Ptolemy, I think it was, found 777. And Brahe or Kepler thought there was 1,034. And then somebody invented the telescope. And the bigger and better the telescope, the more stars that we find. But God told you that a long time ago. He said, look to the stars and see if you can number them. And I want you to know... God, the Son, our Savior, our glorious Savior, the Lord Jesus, holds everything together. He sustains everything. It says it this way in Colossians, He is before all things, and by Him all things consist. A few years ago, scientists discovered another particle in the atom other than the neutron and the proton and the electron. It's called the Higgs boson particle. And here's what it says about it. It says it is what gives other particles mass, which allows them to bind together and form things. Well, I think they almost caught up with the Bible. He is before all things, and by Him all things consist. Do you know if our Savior stopped exercising His divine power for one moment, the stars would burn out in their sockets. Uh, our earth would stop rotating on its axis. The entire universe would implode. Our Savior sustains everything by His power. He's glorious because He stays Verse 10, Thou, Lord, in the beginning has laid the foundation of the earth and the heavens are the works of thy hands. They shall perish. Thou remainest. They all shall wax old as a garment and as a vesture shalt thou fold them up and they shall be changed. But thou art the same and thy years fail not. Did you know there was a time when there was no time? And there will be a time when time will be no more, but there never was a time there was no God. Our Savior has existed forever, and the earth is going to disappear one day. The elements shall melt with a burning heat, and God will be done with this earth, and it'll make a new heaven and a new earth, but it'll be the same God, and we'll have the same Savior. We have a glorious Savior. He astonished the priests and scholars as he 
showed his wisdom as a 12 year old in the temple. He amazed his followers as he healed the blind and made the lame to walk. He alarmed the religious leaders by the folks who followed him instead of them. He astounded his critics when they laughed him to scorn. He said, the damsel's not dead. She's just asleep. But he took her by the hand and said, Talitha Kumai, damsel arise. And she was brought back to life. He blasted the hypocrites, called them whited sepulchers. He bewildered his accusers with questions they could not answer. He stood bereaved outside the tomb of Lazarus and wept. And then he said, roll the stone away. And he said, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead. I love that word. Those words was dead. We don't ever talk about death in the past tense. You don't say, brother, well, that is your father dead? And hear me say, well, he was. But I haven't checked recently. No, no, death is permanent until Jesus comes along. He that was dead came forth and was alive. He befriended a woman at a well that nobody else wanted to talk to and told her that he was the water of life. He confronted the double standard of the people in John 8 who brought a woman taken in adultery but didn't bring the man. He had compassion on the multitudes. He cleansed the lepers. He controlled the elements and amazed his disciples. He destroyed the arguments of the Pharisees. He delivered the maniac of Gadara from his bondage and his demonic influence. He defended little children and said, let them come to me. He distributed two fish and five loaves and fed 5,000 people. We have a glorious Savior. His followers love him. The Spirit led him. Judas left him. His foes loathed him. We adore him. The world abhors him. They want to abolish him, but they can't avoid him. Hospitals were founded in his name. Universities were formed to spread his God gospel. Our dating system bears his imprint. We say it's Anno Domino, the year of our Lord, and the whole world celebrates his birthday at Christmas time. He's a glorious Savior. He's unchangeable. He's unequaled. He's unstoppable. His presence is unavoidable. We preach in His name. We pray in His name. We present ourselves in His name and call ourselves Christians. We proclaim His name and we labor with limited vocabulary and inadequate expressions of speech to lift up the sweet, the supreme, the special, the supernatural name of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. What a glorious Savior. Jesus, oh, how sweet the name. Jesus, every day the same. Jesus, let us all proclaim the name of Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus is the sweetest name I know. There is a name that I love to hear. I love to sing. It's worth it. Sounds like music in my ear. The sweetest name on earth. Oh, how I love Jesus. My Jesus, I love thee. I know thou art mine for thee. All oh, the folly of sin I resign. My precious Redeemer, my Savior, art thou if ever I love thee my Jesus tis now what a glorious savior we have and then our text tells us we have a great salvation how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation it's great in its extent how great is it well the Bible says it's so great you say to your wife I love you so the Bible says God so loved the world. It's just a little word, so, but it has a world of meaning in it. It's like the Lord says you don't have words in your vocabulary to explain the extent of the salvation and its greatness. So I'm just going to tell you it's so great. The songwriter had the same dilemma. He said, could we uh, with ink the ocean fill? And where the skies of parchment made, where every stalk on earth a quill, and every man a scribe by trade, to write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry. Nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky, O oh, love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong, it shall forevermore endure the saints and angels' song. So great is our salvation. A great extent, but it's a great expense. It's free to me. As a little boy, I heard about Good Friday and I found out that's the day the Lord Jesus supposedly was crucified. I don't think so. I think he was crucified on Thursday where I read the Bible. But uh, I said to my dad, Daddy, if it's the day they killed Jesus, why do they call it Good Friday? He said, son, it wasn't good for him, but it was good for us. 
took his body and buffeted his face. Isaiah said his visage was marred more than any man. He didn't even look like a human being. They took a cat of nine tails, nine strands on a whip with little bits of metal and, and glass and bone, and they drug it across his back. The book of Isaiah, I think it is, says the plowers plowed long furrows in my back. They jammed a crown of thorns into his head. Moss of blood had weakened him physically. They put a heavy cross beam of the cross and made him carry it up what we call the Via Dolorosa. And he stumbled and fell. And Simon of Cyrene, who I envy, got to carry the cross of the Lord Jesus. They took him and nailed him to that cross, big old nails in his hands and feet. They picked it up. They dropped it in the hole prepared for it and jerked the bones out of his socket. He hung there not as the artist will picture him appropriately with a loincloth on. No, the Romans left you no decency and no dignity. Bearing shit. Shame and scoffing rude in my place condemned he stood sealed my pardon with his blood hallelujah what a savior and all that physical torment elicited not one response the sheep before shears are dumb so open he not his mouth but then came the awful moment the part I think he dreaded in the garden of Gethsemane the Bible says he, God, made him, Jesus, to become sin for us. Choir sang such a beautiful song about that a moment ago. That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And on the back of our Savior was every vile thing that all men in history have been able to imagine. Every evil thing that they have done. Every wicked thought that they have ever held in their mind. Every filthy word they've ever spoken. And they're all placed on the back of our Savior. And for the first time in all of eternity, God the Father turned his back on and was separated from God the Son. And our Savior hung on the cross and now he cries out, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. Than I, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Great expense and a great effect. What happens when you get saved? Oh, your sins are all forgiven. All of them. All of them. They're washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. And God puts him in a special place. He doesn't hide him in a vault and drag him out and wave him in your face when you misbehave. He doesn't use him to blackmail you into some kind of good behavior. No, no. He removes him as far as the east is from the west. He puts him behind his back. He buries him in the deepest sea and he remembers him no more. You ask me why I'm happy. I'll tell you why. It's because my sins are gone. Marvelous effect. My sins are gone. I become God's child. Isn't that amazing? God made himself my father. He made me part of his family. It's wonderful what the Corals did for Clarence and what they've done to help so many people over the years. But, oh, that's nothing compared to God taking worthless, wretched human beings whose very best deeds are as filthy rags in his eyes and cleansing them by the blood of his son and then not leaving them alone but making them his children and indwelling them by his spirit and promising to never leave us or forsake us and guaranteeing us a place in heaven. He said, I go to prepare a place for for you it took him six days to make everything you see in the universe he's been gone 2,000 years making our place I bet it's pretty nice the longer I live the more impressed I am with the power of the gospel and many of you know the story he was out of the army after World War II decided to go to Columbia University never heard the gospel in his life Met a couple of guys on a bus that he'd known when he was a boy. They were the only boys in his neighborhood that went to church but didn't go to a Catholic church. He never went to church. Catholic father, Methodist mother, occasional, maybe three or four times in his life, visited some liberal church. What are you going to do? Oh, we're going to go to Columbia, he said, be a radio announcer. Well, you ought to come to our college. We've got a radio program. We have our own radio station. Where do you go to school? We go to Bob Jones University in Greenville, South Carolina. He'd never heard of it. But they had a different attitude and they had a different spirit and they impressed him and they got his information and they 
his address, and they sent stuff to him. And Bob Jones accepted him before Columbia did. And, and almost on a whim, he got on a bus from Massachusetts to South Carolina. He said, well, I like the South. I was in it when I was in the service. I guess I'll go to school down there. And in January of 1949, he heard an old fiery preacher named Bob Jones Sr. And Bob Jones Sr. started that semester as he did every semester with a revival campaign. And he said, young man, what if your mother knew everything? thing you'd ever done he said I wouldn't want that and then he said God knows and having convicted his conscience of his sin he went on to explain that there was an escape from his sin there was a redemption available there was forgiveness and it was all through the Lord Jesus Christ and he preached the gospel and the young man said wow that sounds like a good deal to me boy it is a good deal it's the best deal you'll ever find in your life he would have told you to the day he died that he was saved sitting in his seat. That's when he decided to believe on the Lord Jesus. But they told him to come forward, and he did. Monroe Parker met up at the front and said, What are you laughing at? Wasn't laughing at anything. The joy of the Lord had begun to fill his spirit and express itself on his countenance. And I'm really glad they preached the gospel that night. That young man is my dad. And I exist as a human being because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And my dad led thousands of people to Christ and trained hundreds of people to be soul winners and had marvelous ministries. And you know why? Because of the gospel. Listen to me. A lot of churches are doing nonsense today. They don't have to do. And I think a lot of it stems from a low view of the gospel. Well, you know, we have to do it for music because they think our music is boring. Please. You're not soul winning. No person I ever led to Christ asked me about our church's music. They had no expectations about music. They just knew I told them how to go to heaven and they were going to come to church afterwards. We could have been doing Gregorian chants. We could have had no music at all. We could have been like the Church of Christ and not had any instruments. It wouldn't make any difference. Then, well, we gave a survey out, and the biggest complaint we get is our music is boring. Let me tell you, that survey, those answers don't come from unsaved people looking for some hope and help. They come from a bunch of pastor-swapping, church-hopping Christians. You don't have to do the world's music. The gospel changes them. You don't have to change you to attract them. You let the gospel change them and attract them to the Lord Jesus and to godly music. You don't have to have a light show. You don't have to uh, dumb down the Bible. You don't have to change the Word of God to make it culturally relevant. No, you just preach the Word and the Gospel will change their lives and give them an appetite for things they never had before. It's a great salvation. And then our text tells us about a grievous slipping. We ought to give more earnest heed to the things which you've heard lest at any time we let them slip. If the word spoken by angels was steadfast and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, God always dealt with sin, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? That's not talking about neglecting getting saved. It's written to Christians. The author uses the word we, he includes himself. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Slip and neglect are both passive words, but not active words. The word slip is a nautical term. It's only used this time in the Bible. And it has the idea of just letting something drift down the current. You didn't tie your boat up tight to the dock and it just floats on down the river. It just slips. You see, if you don't swim against the tide in the river of life, you will be carried away by the tide. You won't do it on purpose. Remember the day that uh, you consciously said, I'm going to stop reading my Bible. I won't read it every day from now on. Remember that? You don't remember that? Remember when your church voted from now on, we will not require our workers and officers to faithfully attend all the services of the church. Remember that? No church ever voted on that. 
I preach to the church. I love the pastor. I'm glad to go and try to help him. Less than a third of the church members, the staff members, even attend the church. And most of them weren't there for the services that I preached in the revival. They didn't decide that. They didn't make a policy change. They just let it slip. I'm well aware of the ecumenical compromise of the late Billy Graham. I'm also aware that he preached a faithful gospel. And that I'm intrigued by an illustration preacher, I know Johnny Pope told one time. Billy Graham and his wife some years ago were watching television. And it got a little bad and... They were kind of intrigued by the program. They were watching it. Billy Graham got under conviction and he said, Ruth, we wouldn't have watched that 10 years ago. And they got on their knees and asked God to forgive them. Now, I'm not going to bring Catholics together to have some great crusade. I understand that that's wrong and I hope you understand it too. But I want to tell you something. He had a little better sense than some of us to find out he'd let something slip. Nobody said, I'm going to start watching R-rated movies. Nobody, no church ever said, well, we're going to let our young people just go ahead and dress like it. Well, it just happened a little bit at a time. It just slipped away. It was just gradual that it took place. I'm the oldest of five children. I was born in 1952. My brother was born in May of 19, well, let's see, it would be uh, 1968. I was 15, almost 16. He was born in May. I left home in August, went off to school. I was back some along the way, and I watched the, my parents. They were older when my brother was born. They were tired. They'd raised four other children, and when I was a boy, my parents were strict. You would eat your vegetables. My mother was German, and the German method of cooking is to virtually obliterate all food before you put it on the table. I didn't know till I was 25 years old that cauliflower could be crisp. I didn't. And you put that stuff in your mouth and it disintegrates into a thousand pieces, made me want to throw up. I'm not, I'm not exaggerating. I could explain more, but I'll be kind. Wow. But I ate it. Because if I said they didn't like it, they put another tablespoon on my plate and I ate that too. There wasn't any choice in the matter. And I watched my parents. And that's just a young man. I'm maybe 19. My brother's four. I said, Mom and Dad, you wouldn't have let me get away with that. My brother's been married three times. The second and third wives were expecting his child before the wedding day. That's the same parents I had, except... Except they let some things slip. My parents are great people. My mother's hardworking and, and generous. Negative, but hardworking and generous. My dad loved the Lord and loved people happy. And they didn't sit down and say, you know what, let's raise this one differently. Let's see how it'd work if we didn't do the things we thought the Bible said that we did on the others. No, they just let it slip. You never said, I'm going to stop going to my prayer time. You never said, I'm not going soul winning anymore. You just let it slip. As a little boy, we'd go to Massachusetts in the summer, we'd go to Mesquamac at Rhode Island to go to the ocean. And I've always enjoyed water and been a fairly good swimmer. And, and my parents just kind of leave me be. And I'd, I'd go out in the ocean and catch a wave and come to the shore. And I'd go back and let a wave catch me and come back. And I did that several times. And I was shocked. I came to the shore and I looked up and I couldn't see anybody I knew. I didn't see anything I knew. I didn't recognize anything. I, I didn't realize it. But every time I went out, the water was just carrying me a little further away from the point of my parents and my family. Way, way down the shore. They were very disappointed when I found them. I didn't mean to get far away, I just slipped. You never made a conscious decision, I'm going to stop being nice to my wife. I'm going to stop calling her occasionally and telling her I love her. I'm going to stop buying little presents for her. I'm going to stop saying the words. You didn't do that, you just let it slip. It's passive, so is the word neglect. Somebody told me a story Dr. Jack Trieber told. He, 
had a widow lady in his church and she had car trouble and he went over a budget and he said, you know what, I think we can get you a brand new car. It'll be a smaller car, a little bit modest. I think you can afford the payments. And he worked with her and he got a car and she was so happy to have a dependable car. And some time went by, a few years, and she's having terrible trouble with her car. Made funny noises and smoke came out and didn't want to start. And he thought, that shouldn't be the case. You know what they found out? They helped her get the car, but nobody told her how to take care of it. She'd never changed the oil. She'd never done any routine maintenance, never changed an air filter, nothing. She didn't abuse the car. She didn't smack it into a tree somewhere. She didn't beat it with sledgehammers. She didn't leave the hood open and let the water pour in. No, no, no. She just neglected it. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation. Our people who know who this is, it's all right. We had a, we've had many evangelists over the years be part of our church, been a great blessing to us. This evangelist was amazing. When he preached, and his messages didn't have the most content of anybody I heard, but man, half the crowd had come forward. He always liked police work, did some of that, got me in, involved in being a sheriff's chaplain. I noticed one day he used a word he shouldn't have used in conversation, and I talked to him about it. He said, no, no, I, I didn't say that. I said this. I said, no, you didn't. You said that. He had some excuse. He got working uh, full time in a police department. He got a partner that was a lady, and she became his partner more than just on the job. And the day came we had as a church to officially write a letter which I read from the pulpit and we adopted telling him we loved him we wanted him to come back and that was our heart but while he was living like he was he couldn't be a member of this church then he got interested in her daughter and then he went to jail he stayed there nine years he never one time said I think I'd like to go from being a cop to a crook a criminal I think I'd like to go from preaching how people can be removed from bondage and changed to being put in bondage in prison. He never decided to do that. He just let it slip. You know, I, I get around a little bit, and I'm really encouraged by a lot of things I see in our churches, but I see some people just letting stuff slip. If you're old and you're worried about health, you have underlying health issues, I'm not fussing at you. As long as you don't fuss at me for not worrying about it. But, man, there's a heap of people could be in church that aren't. There's a heap of churches could be having services that aren't. Their churches could be doing something to spread the gospel, but they're not. And they let the COVID crisis be an excuse to just let things slide a little bit. So easy. Sit on your couch in your pajamas eating potato chips and pretend that's church. It's about like watching the galloping gourmet instead of eating dinner. I'm glad it's there. I'm happy you can do it. There are some benefits, some people who don't have other alternatives, and I understand that. But man, if you can be in the house of God and you don't have a health issue concern, be in church. If you can have church, have church. If you can knock on doors, knock on doors. If all you can do is leave door hangers and do that. If you can talk to people, do that. But don't let the work of God slip. That man's son went off to Bible college. The former evangelist I mentioned. He met a beautiful young lady and married her. She was a member of our church for a while. Great voice. They get off in St. Louis, Missouri, and he got into all kind of stuff, drinking, gambling. I was preaching out that way. I went to see him. I begged him to come back. I told him he was always the way back, and he wept. But he wouldn't change. It's perilous. It's passive. If we let it slip, if we neglect it, we won't escape. The word spoken by angels was steadfast. Every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward. This grief is slipping. It's passive. It's not purposeful. It's perilous. But I want you to understand it is not 
permanent. One of the great lies of the devil is that once you mess up, God doesn't want you anymore. I worked real hard, and pastor is as well, to have a church where everybody felt welcome and everybody felt loved, and we understood that your past does not have to determine your future. I tell often in the class I taught for newer Christians the story of a man that had been a wicked sinner, and he got saved, and he was preaching in a town, a town where he lived when he was in the world, and somebody put a note on the pulpit where he's going to preach, and he opened it up and read it. It was a list of terrible sins. And the accusation was that that man had committed all those sins in that town. They thought they'd rattle him. They thought they'd say, who do you think you are preaching to us? You did all these terrible things. But the man opened the letter and he read the first sin out loud and he said, that's true. He read the second sin, he said, that is true. And he read the next sin, and he said, that is true. And the next one, that is true. And he read the entire list and acknowledged that everyone was true in his life. And then he went to the Word of God, and he read, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor effeminate or covetous shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. You go to AA and stand up 20 years after you had your last drink and say, My name is R.B., and I am an alcoholic, but not with Jesus. Jesus. Jesus put your sins in the past ten such words, some of you, but you're washed, you're justified, you're sanctified by the Spirit of God and in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hey, it is not permanent. It doesn't have to be. God told the children of Israel that in the book of Jeremiah. Oh, it's a book telling them they're going to spend 70 years in captivity, but all through the book there are opportunities for them to repent. Jeremiah 18, God has taken Jeremiah to the potter's house, and the potter makes a vessel and is marred, and he makes it again another vessel. Does it seem good to the potter to make? And God said, Jeremiah, I can do with you just like the potter did with that vessel. At what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and a kingdom to pluck up and to pull down and destroy, if that nation against whom I have Pronounce that judgment will turn from their evil. I will repent of the evil that I thought to do to them. Hey, God loves you every moment of every day. He's never stopped loving you. And the instant you turn back to Him, you can be reconciled to Him. We had another man in our church. You all know his name if you've been here very long. Larry Owen. Lived out in Millington. I went to visit him one night. He told me a story. He was saved in jail. Somebody gave him a New Testament. He read it, holding it outside the bars of his cell by a security light. Came to the story of the thief on the cross, and he said, you got a lot of guts. You're a thief just like me. He was in for burglary. He said, God's not going to save you. And then he read where Jesus said, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. He said, Lord, you took that thief, will you take this one? And he got saved. And he got out of jail and he helped start a church in Alaska and he started a church out in the country here a little bit. He was married to a really negative woman. Her family would tell me they'd give her a Christmas present and before she'd open it she'd say, I'm not going to like it. He told the story from this spot. Said one day she told me to leave the house once too often. He said, I left but I took somebody else with me and broke up another home. He'd been out of church 19 years when I visited him that Thursday night. And he said, would you let us attend your church? And I said, of course. <laughs> the church is a spiritual hospital. We don't kick the sick people out. <laughs> if we did, we'd have nobody left. <laughs> And he and Carol Owen came to this church and became two of the best members First Baptist Church of Bridgeport's ever had. Sang in the choir, wrote a tract, got into the jail. Amazing thing, a convicted felon was allowed into the jail. It's hard to do, he got it. Every time we'd have testimonies for stewardship or something, I'd love to have him give a testimony. It's always a blessing. Last year he was healthy. He never missed one Sunday morning service, one Sunday night service, one Wednesday night service, one time soul in here, one time at his jail ministry. Gave 51% of his fairly modest income to the work of God here at First Baptist Church of Bridgeport. 
He said to me, I hope the most trouble I ever cause you is when you have to bury me. And that wasn't trouble. It was the only thing close. He got cancer. He got a little better. And, and it looked like he was coming back. And I went to see him in the hospital. And he said, you know, Pastor, if this is cancer, he said, I don't think I'm going to do anything. He said, I'm 70 years old. What's wrong with going to heaven? <laughs> he said, I worry about Carol, but the Lord can take care of her better than I can. <laughs> you know what? His slipping was pretty perilous, but it wasn't permanent. I was preaching in Missouri, Festus, Missouri, outside of St. Louis. I hadn't preached that particular sermon, and another man had preached, and I was at the altar praying, and I heard what sounded like an old man praying next to me. Oh, God, we need your power. Oh, God, we need your help. Oh, God, we need your strength. And I kind of peeked to see who it was. It was the son of that evangelist. It was still in the St. Louis area, but had gotten thoroughly right with God. It was attending that church, had become a deacon, went on to serve on the staff of North Love Baptist Church in Rockford, Illinois, and now is pastoring the Bible Baptist Church in Pascagoula, Mississippi. His slipping was perilous, but it was not permanent. See, uh, whether your story ends up like that guy or that guy, depends what you do now. Lord, guide me as I extend the invitation. Help me. Help us. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. I didn't try to read a laundry list of all the areas in which a person might have slipped. I wonder, I wonder if you say, you know what, Brother Willette, I appreciate the Word of God and agree with its truth, and I think... As far as I know, I'm, I'm not slipping. As far as I know, the Spirit of God didn't deal with me about any area that I need to correct or improve, anything I need to straighten out. Nothing I've neglected and nothing I've let go. Probably somebody like that. If you can say that, would you hold your hand up high? God bless you. Thank you. I would say maybe eight, nine people raise their hand. Praise God. If you couldn't raise your hand, that would mean you've let something slip, wouldn't it? Would you let the Lord do the work He's already started to do and not let it be permanent? Would you come out of your seat right now, wherever you are, and find a place at the altar to talk to the Lord? And so I want to give earnest heed to those things. I do not at any time want to let them slip. Lord, you're so good to us, so much better than we deserve. Huh. Thanks for your word that helps us and reminds us. And your spirit that prompts us and convicts us. Help us as we pray now to do real business with you. Lord, I pray that a long time from now when we've forgotten where it was said or who said it, we remember what you told us this night. Thank you in Jesus' name.